Hi, my name is Jamie Goodwin, and I am a disciple in the Mercer Campus Ministry. And I've been asked to share some of my thoughts and key takeaways um, from F Esther chapter 5 and 6. In verse 1 it says, On the third day, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the palace in front of the king's hall. I wanted to spend a little bit of time on this on this verse here because it really struck me and I think it deserves a little bit more emphasis and it seems like it's given in the chapter it, it's one sentence here she is Esther put on her royal robes and stood that's what we get <laughs> after you know fasting this is what happens she did it on the day she said she would and I think for me, what one takeaway that I get from this is sometimes all we can do is put on our robes, stand still, and let God work. In the end of chapter four, as I said before, we end off with Esther afraid but determined. And she decides that she's going to act in three days after fasting in communion with all the Jews in Susa. But here's the truth. <laughs> Nothing in her world changed in three days. Although God has worked powerfully in three days and can, in this story, we don't see or hear God's apparent intervention, even in Esther and her people's fasting and mourning. We are not told that during the three days that Esther hears the booming voice of God from the heavens telling her, do not be afraid for I will be with you. Or that a storm cloud appeared and the thunderous presence of God was made known to her. We are simply told at the end of three days, she put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court. Sometimes all we can do and all we can offer is our trust in God's sovereignty and his sovereign plan. Esther had no guarantee God would keep her from harm or even death. She had no guarantee that she would live long enough to even present a single request to the king on behalf of her people, who had now been sentenced to death. But Esther heard the words of Mordecai and took them to heart. She understood that remaining quiet would not save herself or anyone around her. I think it's so easy for us um, to look at the little it feels like we can offer the world, or even in specific situations, we can think about, we can think that speaking up on behalf of people who are hurting or suffering, be that the body or our neighbors is just too risky. We could be ostracized from our places of comfort or privileged status. And we think, how then could speaking on behalf of them done do us any good or anyone else for that matter? Sometimes it's smaller, you know, um, and you have an opportunity to maybe share about your walk with God um, and, and the choices that you make made with a friend who's hurting. But you think to yourself, well, they don't believe in God. <laughs> what will this do? Maybe I'll just lose my friend so you remain silent. Maybe it's something bigger, like you want to speak out against a culture in your workplace or just your life group um, that you think has been marginalizing specific identity groups. But again, you remain silent because you are waiting for the booming voice of God to, to confirm to you that this is truly the right, right way to move. Whatever it is, we often make a habit of limiting God's power by refusing to just put on our robes and stand still. Esther did not have more certainty of the outcome after three days, but her greatest power over the towering force of evil that was Haman was her simple trust in God. She trusted that a life lived boldly for God was a life well lived. So regardless of if she lived or died, standing up for God's people would not be in vain. So Esther leveraged the favor she had been granted 
put on her royal robes and stood and let God do the rest. Are we willing to do the same in our lives? Or will we wait till the rocks cry out in praise of God to let God's might and glory be revealed in our world? So moving on to the next point. In Esther 5.3, um, we sort of see that the king, it's sort of a quick point here. But after all this, right, we, we know that Esther enters the inner courts and is not even sure if she's going to live. Um, and God, who didn't doesn't seem to appear in the book, his name is not mentioned once, still seems to be working boldly and loudly on behalf of his people. Because when the first thing that the king says to Esther before she has laid any requests before him that he is willing to grant even up to half of his kingdom to her if she asks. King Cersei's, as we already kind of know, is, is kind of crazy and irrational. Um, he does all kinds of crazy behaviors and emotions, but God was not concerned with the conditions of his mind or heart or even the behavior. When it came to his sovereignty and glory, so it, it might even, it's probably most likely that Cersei's crazy emotions, that maybe a more tempered king would not have offered so gladly and freely to the request of his queen, but God was able to use this young Jewish orphan made queen for the salvation of his people because of this situation, right? Like it, it's crazy to think that God can work through anything if we're willing to just stand and let him do the rest. Continuing on in the story, you know, Esther chooses not to reveal um, her true petition and, and what she wants to say. And, and sort of we see there's a lot going on here, but we sort of get to this point where Esther invites the king and Haman to a banquet. Um, and they have the banquet and the king asks her the same thing again. He says, okay, Esther, uh, I'll give you anything you want. And literally, I'll even give you half my kingdom if you ask. Just tell me what you want. And Esther, you know, once again decides to, to remain silent on her petition and invites them again to a banquet. And I think the sort of my second key takeaway here when we jump actually away from Esther and into a sort of different kind of story with Haman, we, we jump scenes, um, is that, is this. If we can only feel tall when someone else is on their knees, or in other words, when, we, when our worth derives from anything other than our God, then something has gone terribly wrong. We jump to the scene with Haman and he clearly feels good about himself. Mordecai refused to bow down to him. And not only is he going to kill him, but he's gonna kill his entire people, all the Jews. He probably expected that Mordecai would be afraid of him, right? Like he had shown that his rage and his power and Mordecai seemed helpless against him. But unfortunately, to Haman's shock, Mordecai does not appear afraid, not perturbed at all by the presence of Haman. Haman felt he was only important because he could destroy and punish his enemies. He was powerful because Mordecai was weak, or at least he thought. He lived his whole life in comparison to someone else or something else. In fact, in verse 13, we are told that even with all his great power, riches and honor with the king, it gave him no satisfaction as long as he saw the Jew Mordecai sitting at the king's gate. Haman was enslaved to the fragile game of comparison. 
For many of us, it may seem extreme to imagine impaling someone because they don't honor us or our status. But let's not pretend that we don't get caught in the trap of comparison. Especially as women, we live in a society that judges our worth by our physical features in comparison to others or by the approval of another human being. If no one tells you you're beautiful, then you simply aren't. And worse, somehow you've become less valuable. And we like Haman can become deeply disturbed when we think that our status, ability, physical features, a house, or even just our identity makes us worthier than someone else who lacks it. When we lose that status, ability, or physicality, we become completely insecure and unsure of ourselves. Or if someone challenges our superiority complexes by remaining secure in their own body status or ability, we become enraged and angry. Why should they live so free of burden and yet we are always concerned about needing the next thing? Continuing on, we sort of learn that Haman, under the advice of his friends, you know, in order to try to solve this problem of why doesn't he feel worthy enough, was going to impale Mordecai. But again, it seems that there is some kind of divine intervention happening. Because in chapter six, we hear that the king could not sleep that night. And so the king, you know, as crazy as he is, kind of decides to read from a book that talks about all the, you know, chronicles all the things that have happened in his reign. And so he happens upon the story of Mordecai revealing a plot against his life by two of his, his guards. And he thinks to himself, oh my goodness, like, why hasn't Mordecai been rewarded for saving my life? Um, and whatever. So we have this whole moment where Haman happens to be lurking around at night in the courts, um, having just put up this um, pole to impale Mordecai the next morning. Um, and he asked him, he asked uh, Haman, like, how should I honor a man? And Haman thinking like, of course the king's gonna honor me, has this really elaborate scheme that he tells him to, to honor someone with royal robes and horses and all these kinds of things. And sort of to his surprise, uh, the king tells Haman, okay, do this for Mordecai the Jew. And I think what I love about this scene is, is Mordecai is presented as almost the foil of Haman. Because if Haman gained his worth from things or comparison to Mordecai, Mordecai, not at all. He does not feel more or less valuable when given things. In fact, we have this whole scene where he, you know, gets on the horse in the royal robe and Haman is screaming to all the people that this is what happens when the king honors you. And we're told that Mordecai started out sitting at the king's gate and then finished sitting at the king's gate he didn't think that it was more val he was more valuable or less after this um even having been honored by the king uh and so what i think here or, or i guess what i see here is that mordecai did not put his stock in that of human praise or status or anything else he placed his identity his worth and his trust in the God of Israel. And by the end of this chapter, it is Mordecai who appears to be powerful against his adversaries, not Haman. For Haman's wife declares in verse 13, with what seems a, a utter certainty, that since Mordecai, before whom your downfall has started, is a, of Jewish origin, you cannot stand against him. You will surely come to ruin. So I'll end with this. What I notice in these two chapters is that it appears true power and might does not come from riches or some kind of position or even physical might. The true power that all will tremble before that can move mountains comes from a simple and assured trust in God and his sovereignty. Thanks.
for letting me speak.